Greetings, friends. My name is Lucas Mann. I am the pastor of the Spring Church from Lawrence, South Carolina. And uh, friends, I come here this evening with some brothers and sisters of mine in the Lord Jesus for the express singular purpose of preaching to you the gospel of grace. Uh, we are here to bring God the glory through the exaltation of His Son, Jesus Christ. We're here to tell you about Jesus, about who He is, about what He has done, what He has said, what He has accomplished for His people, and how sinners can have salvation in this great Savior. Acts 4.12 tells us there is no other name given under heaven among men by which we must be saved. There is no other name but the name of Jesus Christ that you can be saved by. We're here to warn you about the wrath of God which is to come, which will soon befall the wicked. Friends, we come out here out of a desire, out of a care for your soul, a desire to see you made right with your Creator. For you are either currently in a right standing with God or you are in a wrong standing with God. You are either the friend of God or you are the enemy of God. And we trust and hope that God would use the preaching of the Gospel of His Son to bring you into a saving relationship with Him. To rescue you from the domain of darkness and to bring you into the kingdom of His beloved Son. And we trust that if God so desires and so wills, He will do that in you. We leave the results up to God and we are simply faithful and desire to be more faithful to preach the Gospel of grace to a lost and dying world. The Gospel of Jesus Christ. And so friends, the text of Scripture that I would like to highlight before you this evening is out of the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 2, in verse 16. And the Apostle Paul writes these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God. He says, On the day when, according to my Gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. And that is a subject that I would like to consider this evening. The fact that one day God will disclose the things which have been done in darkness and will bring them out into the light of His judgment. He will bring them out under His tribunal and He will punish the wicked. There is coming a day, friends, when Christ will return to this earth and He will come as a raging warrior, as a king to administer justice, to, to render wrath upon the wicked. Friends, Christ in His first advent came as a Savior, as a suffering servant, to lay down His life for His people. But in His second coming, in His second advent, Christ will come as judge, for it will be too late at that point in time for you to repent. In fact, we are told in Scripture that on Christ's return, the wicked shall say to the mountains, fall on us and hide us from the presence of the Lamb. Oh friends, it is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. For His wrath is kindled against the wicked. However, there is safe haven in the Lord Jesus Christ. There is salvation in Him alone. And so it is our strong exhortation that we give to you this evening to flee to Christ, to flee the wrath of God which is to come. To flee or else on that day when He returns, all the things that you have done in secret, all of the perverse thoughts that have entered into your mind, all of the things which you did and you thought no man saw, and truly no man did, God saw and took account of it. Oh friends, when you delete your internet browsing history after viewing things God hates, God remembers that. God takes account of it. Your girlfriend may not see it, your wife may not see it, but my friends, God sees it. He has intimate knowledge of everything that happens in this world, and more than that, He ordains their coming to pass. And friends, I tell you, this God will judge the wicked. 
But praise be to Him alone that He has provided salvation in His Son, that He sent Him to satisfy His wrath against sin and to be raised from the grave on the third day. This is the beauty of the Gospel that Christ would lay Himself down to satisfy the wrath of God. And friends, ultimately it is this Gospel that I seek to preach to you in this sermon. But before I consider these realities and these truths, I want to quickly convey to you where Paul has come from here in Romans 2 and where Paul is ultimately going. Concisely put, the message that Paul is conveying in Romans 2 is this, is it does not matter whether you are religious or not. It does not matter whether you have, quote, good deeds on your account. You are still a sinner in the eyes of God and you still need salvation. It does not matter whether you have grown up in church or not. It does not matter whether you are even involved in church to this very day. If you have not the righteousness of Christ credited to your account, then you will be eternally lost. For there is no amount of righteous deeds that you can perform that can make you righteous enough to stand before God. No good deeds brought any a soul to heaven. Only the grace of God is the means of salvation. As Paul himself wrote in Ephesians 2, that it is by grace that we are saved through faith, and that not of ourselves, but it is the gift of God, not as a result of works, so that no one may boast. It is all for the glory of God, and therefore it necessitates that it is by the grace of God. In Paul's day, the Jewish people had prided themselves and thought themselves to be righteous and good enough to make it to heaven. They thought themselves to be just enough to stand before the Creator. But their righteous deeds are like filthy rags, just as ours are. Even the prophet Isaiah, one of the greatest prophets of the Old Testament, said in Isaiah 64 that all of our righteous deeds are like filthy rags. Truly, none of us can make ourselves right by our works. And that is Paul's desire to establish that idea here in Romans 2, so that he ultimately can preach the Gospel in Romans 3. That is ultimately the end that he is writing these things to, to make known the glory of the Gospel. And friends, this is true for you in your own life. You must grasp your sin. You must see that you have offended God and that you deserve His punishment for sin so that you can see the grace that God has put on display in His Son. That you can see the mercy that God has shown in sending His Son to propitiate His wrath. Friends, one can only grasp the grace of Christ insofar as they have seen the wrath of God. And so it is therefore Paul's great desire to show the religious their fault here in Romans 2. That's why he begins in verse 1 by saying, Therefore you have no excuse, every one of you who passes judgment. For in that which you judge another, you condemn yourself. For you who judge practice the same things. Later on, he said this concerning God in verse 6. He said, Who will render to each person according to his deeds? And so here he is showing the religious that one day, a day of judgment is coming when God will, will administer justice upon the earth. He continues on in verse 12. He says, For all who have sinned without the law will also perish without the law. And all who have sinned under the law will be judged by the law. For it is not the hearers of the law who are just before God, but the doers of the law will be justified. Again, he's showing them, okay, if you want to be justified, you must keep the law. But the problem is, is that we cannot keep the law. And we cannot obey God's commands as He calls us to do. And therefore, we are in desperate, dire need of a Savior who will save us from our utter imperfection, our utter hatred of God, and our fallen state that we are in. Listen to what he says in verse 14. He says, For when the Gentiles who do not have the law 
do instinctively the things of the law, these not having the law, are a law to themselves, in that they show the work of the law written in their hearts, their conscience bearing witness, and their thoughts alternately accusing or else defending them. So here Paul is simply saying that everyone has an inherent knowledge of God's justice and right from wrong. Everyone knows right from wrong in a general sense. But the problem is not that we have that knowledge, but it is that we act against that knowledge. We act in contradiction to that which we know to be true and that which we know to be good in the sight of God. And therefore in that do we bring guilt upon our souls that can only be removed by the precious blood of the Lamb, of the Lord Jesus Christ. And so then we find ourselves at the end there of verse 15, flowing right into verse 16, where Paul clearly states of that coming, the, the reality of that coming day when God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. And it is that truth I would like to contemplate this evening. He begins in verse 16. He says, on the day when. And friends, that there reveals to us a great reality. Every day passes by, one after another, and they heap upon one another. Thousands and thousands of days do we see in our own lives. In fact, in an average lifetime, a human being is going to see hundreds, thousands of days. But all those days are ultimately one giant clock counting down to the last day. To that day which is a day of mourning for the wicked and a day of rejoicing for the righteous. A day when the Lord Jesus Christ will return and judge the wicked. A day when the Son of God will come riding on that white horse and He will administer wrath to the enemies of God. This is precisely what the Apostle John testified to in Revelation 19. He begins in verse 11 by writing these words, And I saw heaven open, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it is called Faithful and True, and in righteousness he judges and wages war. His eyes are a flame of fire, and on his head are many diadems, and he has a name written on him which no one knows except himself. He is clothed with a robe dipped in blood, and his name is called the Word of God. And the armies which are in heaven, clothed in fine linen, white and clean, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword, so that with it he may strike down the nations, and he will rule them with a rod of iron. And he treads the fierce, or excuse me, and he treads the winepress of the fierce wrath of God the Almighty. This is vivid imagery of how it shall be on that day when Christ returns. And truly it will be a day of great terror for the wicked. And so it is, my, it is my great desire that you would flee to Christ today, that you would be found in Him, not having a righteousness of your own derived from the law, but the righteousness of Jesus Christ, my friends. Please, I say this because I care for you. Flee to Christ for eternal life. For only the power of Jesus Christ can save you from your sins. Your sins are too great. My sins are too great. Our fallen estate is too hopeless. We need a Savior. We need Christ, the Redeemer. Going back to verse 16 of Romans 2 there, after he says the phrase, on the day when, he writes, according to my gospel, God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. Now it is important that we note the second phrase Paul gives there when he says, according to my gospel. Friends, in order to understand the gospel message, you must understand the bad news of your sin before God. Before you can see the grace of Jesus Christ as it is revealed in His laying down Himself as the Lamb of God to be slain at the cross of Calvary, you must also first, before that, see your depraved and lost state before God. And that is why Paul gives the phrase there, according to my gospel. We know obviously the gospel according to Paul is the biblical gospel. It is the gospel of salvation. It is the same gospel which Jesus preached, and Paul preached, or excuse me, and Peter preached, and all the rest of the apostles. It is the same gospel amongst all the writers of both the Old and New Testament, all the way from Genesis chapter 3 to the end of Revelation. That same gospel 
is the Gospel of Jesus Christ, which is concerning His death, His burial, and His resurrection on behalf of sinners. But as Paul continues in the verse at hand, he says after that, God will judge the secrets of men. Now that is important that we understand this idea that God will judge the secrets of men. Oftentimes people commit sin in private places and in a secret situation where they themselves think no one has seen it. They think to themselves, alas, no one has seen my sin. No one will catch me in this. And they may be right. No one will ever see them in this life. No one will ever find out their guilt. However, friends, God's eyes are probing. God sees everything. God sees what is done in secret. God sees every evil thing that is conjured up in the mind and heart of man. And He takes account of it. It is written down. He knows it, my friends. And the only way that your guilt can be blotted out, the only way that the record of your sin can be totally obliterated, is through the atoning work of Jesus Christ at the cross. It is through the the sacrifice of Christ who Himself bore the wrath of God on behalf of His people. It is only through that means can any sinner have pardon. It is only through that that I'm able to stand up here this evening. God bless you, sir. It is only through that that I am able to stand up this evening before you and proclaim to you this glorious reality because my soul has been cleansed by the blood of Christ. And then lastly, he adds these three words there at the end of verse 16. He says, through Christ Jesus. Now, there is not much for me to say here because I just read to you that portion out of Revelation a moment ago which speaks to the fact that Christ will come on the day of judgment as the judge of the earth, as the raging warrior king who will administer wrath and minister justice upon the wicked. And that is why Paul says there at the end of the verse that God's judging the secrets of men is through Christ Jesus. And not only is God's judgment rendered through His Son, but also His saving grace. There is no other way of salvation but through Jesus Christ, friends. No pope can save you. No pastor can save you. No ecumenical council can save you. No religious leader can save you. It is only through Christ. It is only through the Son of God. It is only through Jesus that we are saved. He is the only anointed Savior who is set apart by the Father to come and to accomplish redemption and to bring the elect of God into eternal glory. But who is this God of Scripture? Who is the God of glory that is spoken of in this passage? Who is this God who will judge the secrets of men through Christ Jesus? Well, right there, that very phrase reveals to us one attribute of God, and that is that God is a just judge. That God is, as the book of Revelation declares to us, the judge of all the earth. In other words, all different types of men, all different types of women and children. There is no one exempt from the judgment of God. Also, we know from Scripture that God is a holy God. That is, that God is set apart from all that is perverse and all that is wicked and all that is evil. You know, we find ourselves living in a society and in a fallen world that is filled with wicked things. And people who do wicked things, even our own hearts, are tainted by transgressions and iniquity. Even we ourselves when we do the greatest acts of of goodness, find that our intents are oftentimes mixed with great sin and pride. But God is not like us, not like this world. His ways are higher than our ways. His thoughts are higher than our thoughts. And He is perfect in His moral perfection. That is what is meant when the Bible says He is holy. In fact, this term is used all throughout the Scriptures. 
to describe God because it is such a fitting term. It is used to describe the Lord Jesus Christ, the second person of the Trinity. It is used to describe the Holy Spirit, the second, or excuse me, the third person of the Trinity. Why is that? It is because the God of glory, the God of Scripture, is three times, thrice holy. In fact, God told the Israelites in Leviticus chapter 11, verse 45, He said, I am the Lord who brought you up from the land of Egypt to be your God. Thus you shall be holy, for I am holy. And that word holy is used over 80 times in the book of Leviticus. And it is used because God is holy. Friends, it is true that God is also gracious and loving. We see these truths put forth in Scripture. And we experience them even in, in this world to a measure. To some extent, do we see these things even in this world? We see that God gives us things that we do not deserve. That speaks to His grace. And even God shows a generic love for all mankind. But these attributes of God never negate and never throw aside His other attributes. But rather, God's attributes stand in beautiful unison and beautiful harmony with one another, never contradicting. God certainly in His character is not self-contradicting, but is perfect. And in no way does He have that about His character. And in God's holiness, in God's righteousness, God has done something, friends. He has given His law. God has put forth His law. And those of you perhaps who have grown up in church, you will recall that the law of God is God's Ten Commandments. That is, it is God's standard of judgment. It is His moral law. God gave these commands in Exodus chapter 20. Commands such as, You shall not lie. You shall not steal. You shall not murder. Why did God put forth these laws for us to obey? It is because God Himself is holy. See, the law of God shows us a couple of things. Firstly, it shows us the character of God. And secondly, it shows us the character of man in light of the character of God. For the same God who said you shall not murder is the God who is not a murderous God. Why did God say you shall not lie? Because God is not a liar. And as the book of Hebrews tells us, it is an impossibility for God to lie. Why does God forbid adultery? Because God, as the Bible clearly speaks to, as the book of Lamentation says, God is faithful. He is covenant keeping. He never goes back on His word. And so for a spouse to go back on their word, to go back on their covenant with their spouse is to do a great evil because it is in contradiction to the character of God. Or we ask ourselves, in Holy Scripture, we find the forbidding of, of homosexuality, of sins like that. Now, why would God say that? Well, we know that the book of Genesis tells us that God in the beginning created them male and female. Why does the command exist? Why does God forbid homosexuality? It is because it is, in, it is in perfect agreement with the character of God and the works of God. Who God is. But when we consider the commands of God, we see something else. And that is the second thing. And that is our breaking of those commands. Our breaking of those laws. We see ourselves as transgressors, having fallen short of the glory of God and without any hope in and of ourselves. Sir, you have to have Christ. You can't put your trust in a church or in religious performance. you got to be saved from your sins through the finished work of Jesus Christ. That's the only way of salvation. But as I was saying, the law of God is there to show us our sin. This is spoken of later in Romans, in Romans chapter 7, when Paul says in verse 9, he says, I was once alive apart from the law, but when the commandment came, sin became alive and I died. And this commandment, which was to result in life, proved to result in death 
in me. For sin, taking an opportunity through the commandment, deceived me and through it killed me. So then the law is holy and the commandment is holy and righteous and good. See, the commands of God are perfect. They're righteous, but what they show us is our imperfection and our unrighteousness and the fact that we are sinners, haters of God. As Paul himself writes in Romans 1, he says this concerning sinners in verse 30. He says that they are slanderers and haters of God. And so therefore, having broken the commands of God, having transgressed the law of God and trampled the, com the covenant of works underfoot, God sees us as we are in our sin before His holy tribunal. And therefore we are condemned and depraved and without hope. And we deserve just punishment for our sin. And God's punishment for sin, friends, is hell. It is the place of punishment for the wicked. It is the place where God unleashes His judgment upon the ungodly. And friends, I don't want you to go there in your sins. I don't want you to go to hell in your sins. Flee to Christ so that you might have eternal life in Him. Otherwise, your soul will be lost. Your soul will be eternally lost in hell forever where the worm does not die and the fire is not quenched. Jesus said that hell is a place of weeping and gnashing of teeth. Jesus says hell is a place of outer darkness. He said it is a place that has an unquenchable fire. Friends, oh my dear friends, and I say that because I have such a care for your souls. Please, flee to Christ. Repent and believe the Gospel. Otherwise, burn. Please do not burn in your sins eternally in hell. Do not be crushed under the weight of the wrath of God for all eternity. Otherwise, what is written in the prophets will come to pass upon you. As Nahum chapter 1 verse 2 says, A jealous and avenging God is the Lord. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on His adversaries. And He reserves wrath for His enemies. And friends, here is where we find ourselves. Here is where you yourself might be this day, a lost sinner in the hands of an angry God, condemned to hell without hope. And friends, this is truly a hopeless situation, a hopeless state. However, I have great news to bear this evening, friends. God in His love towards sinners Send His Son, Jesus Christ. The Gospel is that Jesus saves sinners. Christ came in, as Galatians 4, 4 tells us, when the fullness of the times came, God sent forth His Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, who was born of a virgin, who was born under the law. And as Matthew 5, 17 tells us, He came and fulfilled the law of God. He lived in perfect submission and in obedience to the commands of God that we have broken in our lives. Jesus never lied. Jesus never murdered. Jesus never dishonored His parents. Jesus never committed adultery. Or he never did He lust. Friends, Christ was perfect in His perfect life. And then, at the peak of His ministry, He laid Himself down as the Lamb of God who was slain upon the cross of Calvary. He was nailed there upon that Roman cross. And even before He was nailed to the cross, He was spat upon and made a public mockery. Even His own disciples, out of fear for their own lives, betrayed Him. Even Peter, who told Him that He would be, he would be faithful to the end, even he betrayed the Lord Jesus Christ and left Him. And there is the Son of God upon the cross, hanging there, and on that cross, as Scripture says, He bore the wrath of God against the people of God. Friends, this is a glorious reality. This is how deep the love of God is that God would give up His own Son and He would satisfy His own wrath. On that cross, the Father treated Jesus as if He was a sinner, as if He was a liar, as if He was a thief, as if He was a lawbreaker, though He Himself was perfect. My friends, Jesus Christ took ownership 
of the sins of His people at the cross of Calvary. And the Father crushed Him. As Isaiah 53.10 says, it pleased Yahweh to crush Him, putting Him to grief. If He would render Himself as a guilt offering, He will see His offspring, He will prolong His days, and the good pleasure of the Lord will prosper in His hand. This is the glory of the Gospel, friends, that Christ propitiated the wrath of the Father, that He absorbed it so that sinners could be pardoned. The cross of Christ shows us the justice of God, that God does not sweep sin under the rug, but publicly punishes it. And the cross also shows us the mercy of God towards sinners, that in His love He would provide a vicarious sin-bearer, His Son. And after three days in the tomb, having died for His people, Jesus Christ was raised from the grave. As Romans 4 tells us in Romans 4.25, it says, He who was delivered over because of our transgressions and was raised because of our justification. Christ is alive today, friends, because the Father publicly rose Him up from the grave as the public display that He had received His atoning sacrifice as a sufficient payment for our sins. That Jesus had truly placated, had truly propitiated the wrath of God against us. That there is not an ounce left for the people of God to bear. And after 40 days of further ministry among His disciples, Christ then went to the top of the Mount of Olives there outside of Jerusalem and bodily ascended into glory and sat down at the right hand of the Father. Sat down at the right hand of Majesty on high. And He has completed the work of salvation once for all. He is high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. And He reigns as King, as Lord of the universe. As all things are being put under subje in, in subjection under His feet by the Father Himself. And therefore, the proper reaction that the sinner is to have is one of great humility and brokenness over their sin. Friends, you must repent. Jesus Himself said in Luke 13.3, He said, I tell you no, but unless you repent, you will all likewise perish. And secondly, you must believe. As Romans 4.3 tells us, Abraham believed God and it was credited to him as righteousness. Those two things is what the sinner must do. Repentance is a brokenness of heart and spirit. A grieving, a godly grieving over one's sin. And a and a detesting of one's sin. And one wanting to forsake their sin. And then belief is simply fleeing to Christ and believing the promises of God. Believing that Christ will cleanse you of your sin. You must turn. Let go of your selfishness and your pride. Let go of your pornography and your drunkenness. And flee to Christ Jesus, the Son of God. Believe the Gospel message. Believe the Gospel of grace. Believe that what God said in His Word concerning His Son, Jesus Christ. And friends, the promise of the Gospel is for the, the person who flees their sin and believes upon Christ will have full forgiveness of all sin. Forgiveness, complete pardon of all iniquity past, present, and future on account of the atoning work of Christ at the cross. They will be wrapped. Not only will they be forgiven of their sin, but they will be wrapped in the righteousness of Christ. The Father will credit the repentant believer with having lived Jesus' life because He credited Christ with having lived their life. You see, friends, that is the great exchange of the Gospel. That Jesus takes my sin and I receive His righteousness as a free gift of grace. That Jesus takes my filthy garments of iniquity and I receive His perfect garment of righteousness to clothe me that I might stand before the Father perfect in His eyes though I myself have done nothing to contribute to salvation other than to commit to sin which made it necessary. Oh friends, this is a glorious Gospel. And it is all of the free grace of God. Friends, do you realize, it, even if you are a great sinner, which you are, I am a great sinner. Flee to Christ though. He is a greater Savior. Our sin is great deed, but His, but His love and His grace that He has revealed in His Son. 
the Lord Jesus Christ is greater than our sin. Oh friends, look to Christ alone for eternal life. This is the charge of the Gospel. This is the exhortation that is given in Scripture that you must repent and believe upon the Son of God alone. Your confidence must be in Christ alone, not in anything that you have done before God. For Christ is jealous for all the glory and salvation because He Himself is jealous for His own glory and His own praise and honor. So friends, this salvation is free. Free grace. It costs you not anything. It costs me not anything. Come! As Isaiah 55, 1 says, Ho, oh, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters, and you who have no money, buy. Come, buy and eat. Come, buy wine and milk without money and without cost. And friends, I tell you this much, that if you are saved this evening, or for anyone who is ever saved, their life is changed. They are made a new creation, and their life will bear fruit of such a reality. Such a person who claims to follow Christ but bears not the fruit of conversion is lost. Such a person who says they know Christ but they do not live as though He gave them a law to obey is utterly lost because they never understood the Gospel in the first place. But for the person who is genuinely saved by the grace of God, their life is changed because they have been born from above. They now love the Word of God. They now love prayer. They now love the fellowship of the saints because God has done a work in their hearts for His own glory. By His grace, by the free grace of God, and for the glory of God. That is ultimately the end of this, my friends. It is all for the glory and praise and honor of God. That's what this is all working to, friends. To bring God glory. God has so ordered salvation to be as a free gift of His grace because He is jealous for all the glory. And so friends, I charge you to flee from your sins and to come to Christ to give God the glory for the great things that He has done in His Son, Jesus Christ. To God be the glory indeed. Listen to what Paul said in Romans 16 verse 25. He says, Now to Him who is able to establish you according to My Gospel and the preaching of Jesus Christ, according to the revelation of the mystery which has been kept secret for long ages past, but now is manifested in by the Scriptures of the prophets according to the commandment of the eternal God, has been made known to all the nations, leading to obedience of faith to the only wise God through Jesus Christ, be glory forever. Amen. Amen and amen. Sinners, flee to Christ and have life. You religious hypocrites, flee to Christ and have life. You who claim to know Christ, examine yourselves to see whether you're in the faith. And if you see that you do not live for Christ and that you are lost, flee to Him for eternal life. Flee to Christ for true salvation. And my brethren, my fellow saints, I encourage you to rest upon the Gospel of grace. For this is for the believer. To distribute this Gospel to all whom you come in contact with. For this Gospel is not only for the lost, but it is for believers as well. It is our daily bread to feed upon our manna from heaven. And so I encourage you to preach this Gospel to your lost family and friends that they themselves might be converted and saved for the glory of God. And so friends, in conclusion, we have seen here in Romans 2 verse 16 that there is coming a day when God will judge the secrets of men through Jesus Christ. But we have seen elsewhere that even though we have sinned before God, God has sent His Son Jesus to save sinners to save vile wretches from their sin by dying for them upon the cross of Calvary. And so it is to Jesus Christ, I say to Him be glory and honor and praise and worship and adoration in both your life and mine and in all things as all things work and redound to His glory. To Him be the glory forever 
Amen. Amen.